I'm Ken Kelly, and I've got a real burning passion for counselling skills. I've built training that takes the doubt out of using counselling skills. You get to see the counselling skills used in real live sessions by a qualified therapist. Full sessions, real material, real counselling skills. To find out more, go to counsellingskillsacademy.com. Welcome to the Counselling Tutor Podcast. The must-listen-to podcast for students of counselling and psychotherapy. Here are your hosts, Rory Lees Oaks and Ken Kelly. Hi, I'm Rory. And with me, as always, is Ken. How are you doing, Ken? I'm exceptionally well, Rory. Thank you very much for asking. I'm grateful to be here. And both Rory and I are grateful that you have joined us for the Counselling Tutor Podcast. You've joined us at episode 226, and we've got three topics that we're going to be covering today, starting with those all-important counselling foundations, where we revisit that that underpins counselling. It may be a theory, it may be a, a, a practice element, and today we're looking at a deep theory, and that is the 19 propositions of Carl Rogers. We then move on to focus on self, and that's where we recognise that you, as the practitioner, you the heartbeat of your practice. We need to be okay in order to be there for those that we serve. And today we're going to be speaking about recognizing vicarious trauma. And that would lead us on to our final uh, topic for today, which is practice matters, where we dip our toe into anything that is practice related. It can be an element of running the business of a practice. It can be a presentation we might come across. It may even be the paperwork that we do as running a practice. But today we look at a certain kind of presentation and how to understand that better. Rory met up with Quinn Dexter. This is a two-part interview because there's a lot to cover and it's all about why we shouldn't use person-first language to describe autistic people. Really interesting uh, view here from uh, Quinn. But starting us off, Rory, let's dive in to those counselling foundations. The 19 propositions tell me more. Well, there's nothing more that strikes fear into the heart of learners than the 19 propositions can, um, because on the face of it, it looks impenetrable. And what, are, what am I talking of? Well, I'm talking about Roger's theory of personality as outlined in client-centered therapy in 1951, uh, a good uh, five or six years before he, he published The Necessary and Sufficient Conditions in 1957. So he was on the road to developing his theory. And he, he knew, Carl Rogers knew, that, that any counselling theory had to have a theory of personality. Mm-hmm. So, so Freud had captured the subconscious theory of personality in id, ego, and superego. The behaviourists, people, people like, um, you know, Watson, people like that, had talked about uh, Tabala Rasa, the blank slate, uh, and, 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 you know, the, the more cognitive behavioral therapists of the time had talked about um had talked about uh, the philosophers stoic philosophy so rogers really needed something from from the the classics to be able to kind of cement his theory mm. and he went to phenomenology and phenomenology is the philosophy of lived experience and it was outlined by edmund husserl um, initially, I'm a hustler, German philosopher, and he, he he took that philosophy and he used it as the basis for person-centered therapy. And the 19 propositions are effectively 19 ways that people perceive the world. That's the that's the headline. 19 ways people perceive the world. And if you think about it, Ken. We perceive the world all the time, don't we? I'm sure that if we went to a restaurant, there'd be food you would eat and I wouldn't eat um, because we perceive it differently. Yeah, I like it. And I, I love how you've described the theory, kind of its its underpinnings, where it came from. And I think it, it was written... Uh, at a time when when Rogers was very much in his academic flow, it is full of academic uh, lingo and language. Uh, it has a it has a heaviness to it. And you you started off Rory by saying you know strikes fear <laughs> into the hearts of counselling <laughs> students, and we, we recognise that because we we taught together for many years, and uh, we know that when you mention the, the the nineteen propositions, there's sometimes a groan because it is quite uh, academic 
language. Um, but what's interesting, Rory, as you've kind of a, a, a explained there, it is really just a theory of phenomenology and how we experience life and how we adapt our ways of acting and interacting dis, uh, uh, based on uh, what we perceive and how our organism, which it's referred to in the 19 propositions, being our, ourselves, um, basically engages in goal directive behavior for uh, basically to preserve ourselves and for the betterment of us as an organism so it it, it is very interesting and it's interesting that you mentioned this was written before uh, those uh, necessary and sufficient conditions but what is interesting to me when you look over the 19 propositions for me it could almost have been writ written at the end of, of Rogers's theorizing and the reason I say that is because when you look at the 19 propositions and you study them they bring everything together it's almost they, they bring all of Rogers's theories together into one neat 19 propositions uh, as it were and if the only way to tackle the 19 propositions is to actually go over them and read them. And I think that we would need a very long podcast to do all 19, <laughs> but happy to dive into a few. And you mentioned, Rory, phenomenology and how it's based in phenomenology. And the very first uh, proposition says all individual, all individuals. And then in brackets, it says organisms. So this is where we see the world, word organisms is now going to be used going forward exist in a continuously changing world of experience carefully selected words there and this in brackets phenomenological field so what is a phenomenological field it is the continuously changing world of experience how we are experiencing the world and of which we are the center so roger's says we are the center of that then he goes on the organism reacts to the field as it is experienced and perceived so we as individuals we are looking at life and what is coming at us and we're reacting to that the perpetual field is reality and that is put into like in, in little inverted commas there because reality is really just our perception of this field and then of course the, the they go on further to to explain how and why we would adapt our behaviors to defend our truths that we base on our experiences of this phenomenological phenomenological field i love that word trips me up every time i know it's it's not a word you use every day you don't go down the shops and say i like a phenomenological can of beans do you Ken? <laughs> um and i think what's sometimes also missed <clears throat> is you know there's, there's two things that really 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 strike me with the 19 propositions mm -hmm. first of all um although it's uh, it's not in, in you know it's not implicitly stated it's almost certainly that Rogers drew off his observations of children when he was at the Rochester Children's Home in Rochester in New York, when he was the director of it. And he started the formation of the 19 propositions. And we've talked about, you know, the people he met and, and how, how he formulated person-centered therapy. Um, and if you look at children, I think the best way to look at the 19 propositions, if you've got a small child, I see how those propositions apply to your child and you know i i will come back to a couple um proposition 17 under certain conditions involving primarily complete absence of threat to the self-structure experiences are inconsistent with it may be perceived and examined mm -hmm. and structure of self revised to assimilate and include such experiences big big mouthful of words but if you've got a small child and they've they've put their finger in an electrical socket if you shout at them and say, you know, you're, you're a bad child, they're never going to learn anything, are they? If you say, don't pop your finger in that little socket, or you, you might get a shock, it could hurt you. They're more likely not to put their finger in it. Mm. And Rogers, Rogers I, think, I think the whole of the 19 propositions was written from a childhood view of, of children. And of course, in therapy, as we know, everybody's a stretched out child. You know, we, 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 what we learn in childhood, we carry through into our adulthood. And also what I think about, what I, what I like about Roger's 19 propositions, it's a bit cheeky, Ken, because what he's done, he's, he's taken Freudian ideas and he's repackaged them a little bit about, about you know, how, how we perceive the world. And, and he's, he's, he's shifted them. He's shifted them across to humanism. He's made that shift. It's a wonderful, wonderful theory. 
And, um, you know, if you go to podcast 226, um, you'll be able to find my super duper handout with the 19 propositions decoded. So if you go there, click on that, <clears throat> go to counselingtutor.com, our website, go to podcast episode 226, you'll be able to download the handout. But it, it remains a a cornerstone. The 19 propositions remains a cornerstone of Roger's work. And I think any practitioner should make the effort to understand it because it's the trinity, isn't it? The necessary and sufficient conditions, the seven stages of process, the 19 propositions. They're the table legs that hold the table top up. Yeah, very much so. I love that you you dug into uh, condition 13 there. And if you read condition 13, it speaks about a threat-free environment. Uh, and that translates into not being judgmental. It's that unconditional positive regard. So you can see how the 19 propositions influence the the, the the later theories of those necessary yeah. and sufficient conditions. Um, we can see empathy comes in at um, uh, number seven, where it's the best vantage point of understanding behavior is from the internal frame of reference of the individual. And if you think about it within therapy, specifically if you're working from a person-centered point of view, we're always trying to be in the frame of reference to see it as the client sees it, which is, of course, an empathic place to be. So you can see uh, the layering of the theories. And uh, it, it, it really is, it, it's an interesting theory. I like it. Um, the more I've read it over the years, the more it's made sense to me and the more I grow fond of the 19 propositions. And I think it just brings Rogers's work together. It just cements it all together. Mm. Uh, it really does. And, of course, there is an overflow with uh, other models uh, as there, there is with with I guess we, we've said many times on the on the podcast. If you if you look at all the different psychological models and and the the therapeutic models, they've got some similarities and different words used to describe very similar uh, yes. things. But of course, there are main main differences as well. And of course, like you said, Rory, we're speaking about phenomenology here. We're speaking about a humanistic approach. Um, yeah. There it is. Get Rory's super duper handout. It will help you, specifically if you're a student. But if you're not a student, download it anyway, because it basically takes those 19 propositions, takes all those heavy uh, technical and academic words, and Rory has put them into plain, easy to understand English for you. So you can see how Rogers wrote it, and then you can see a translation of that. Counselingtutor.com podcast tab, episode 226. It's there. It's waiting for you. That is our counselling foundations for today. And of course, we now move on uh, to practice, uh, to focus on self. You see, I can't wait to get to practice matters because I know it's a good a good topic today, Rory. <laughs> to focus on self first. He says, putting the brakes on slightly, where we are recognising vicarious trauma. Now, I think that focus on self, really, really important part. As I've said so many times, Rory, one of my favourite parts of the uh, of, of the podcast because we're looking at ourselves as practitioners without us being okay. We can't be there for others. Vicarious trauma. Tell me more about that. Yes. Well, uh, uh, it, this is something that comes up from time to time in our Facebook page. And if you're not a member of our Facebook page, go to Facebook, type in counseling tutor, a closed group, but our lovely caring moderation team will let you in and you can join thousands and thousands of like-minded people who are talking about the world of counselling and psychotherapy. And vicarious trauma, or, you know, sometimes sometimes referred to as, as burnout, is where you're working um, with a lot of very heavy presentations. <clears throat> and what happens is, is you become traumatised. Mm. And, you know, I was, I was speaking to my wife the, the other day and she said, you know, why, why don't you, you know, why don't you watch certain films? Why do you go upstairs and play on your computer? And it's because my tolerance for watching you know, people being cruel to each other mm. has diminished over the years. As a younger man, I just watch it and take it for what it was. It was a film. Nowadays, I really can't. I really can't watch anything like that. It becomes uncomfortable, and um, a whole panoply of emotions rise up in me. And through the twenty years I've been a practitioner, I've heard some very difficult stories. Should I say very, very difficult stories? And to some extent, <clears throat> it's a mild vicarious trauma. You know, and mm. I think it's something we have to watch out for in our therapy practices, you know, because we, unlike, <clears throat> I think unlike, you know, other colleagues in other professions, say dentists, things like that, we, we, we do tend to perhaps the surface lives of people. 
we hear the very minutiae of, of people's lives. And some of them are very, very distressing to hear. Mm. You know, as a counsellor, I've, I've had on many occasions had to get supervision very shortly after seeing a client because what I was hearing was so distressing. And, you know, it has an impact on us. And how do we know we're getting vicarious trauma? Well, it might be, you know, those kind of signs I described, not be able to watch people being cruel to each other. Um, and also, um, <clears throat> um, you could find yourself not sleeping very well. Um, you could find yourself a little bit down. Um, you could feel yourself, and this is this is the important part, I think, of trying of trying to avoid clients' material in the room. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And and as as you've said so many times before, we can only go as far as the client can go. If we're mm. not looking after ourselves and recognizing that vicarious trauma exists, understanding what it is, and seeing how it might impact us, we can lead to that place of burnout and and burnout is the end of a process it's the it's the very end when you're in burnout you're pretty much kind of going to know it because you you have nothing left to give but the the process from going from being okay within self to burnout is a process that can be invisible mm. and it's during that process that maybe we are not best serving our clients so an important topic to look at i like how you have recognized that what you watch what you consume affects you emotionally mm. and and in within our family we 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 have um selective consumption of what we what we take in and um i i i stopped watching the news for the same kind of reason it's always doom and gloom and catastrophe and pain and suffering and specifically now at the time of this recording there is an invasion going on and it it it, it is heavy and of course it's in the interests of the of the news channels to to push the headlines to 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 get the viewers it, it's good business sadly for for the news to repeat to 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 bring about information that is that is uh heavy and it affects me emotionally as well i can feel my emotions change as i hear a story or watch something and when we're experiencing that change in emotion that that is significant you know we can go oh it's it it, it it's it's only my emotions but wow that's what we work with as counselors mm. we're seeing people who are bringing in their emotions and they're sharing their stories and cruelty or injustice that may have been acted upon them and we are in an empathic relationship where we are trying to look through their frame of reference and and almost experience it as they do and and that is that's a big ask it really is a big ask and we are having these waves of, of, of messaging that is hitting us. And we may find that our emotions are, are grabbed by that. So what, what might we do, Rory, to kind of work with that? If, if say, for instance, we've had a, a, a client that presented with particularly heavy material, you've got that hanging around and it doesn't seem to be shifting. Well, first of all, I'd say go to your supervisor, an early supervision and, and, and process it through your supervisor. And also, uh, don't be afraid of thinking about your own history. A lot of people come to becoming counsellors because they're wounded healers, the, the Chiron story, which you've talked about before on the Counselling Duty podcast. And um, it might be that people, people have had a difficult, you know, earlier life. They've, they've managed to uh, redeem and, and reclaim themselves. Uh, reclaim is probably a better word than redeem, reclaim themselves. And then they go on to train as therapists. And then sometimes they might meet themselves in the therapy room. They might meet someone who's gone through the same thing. So really, really thinking about that. Own personal therapy. You know, I think sometimes if something comes up, and it's staying around. You know, you get sometimes you go to supervision, you process it through supervision, and it's like, oh, it's all gone. Yeah. But if you're finding yourself a week later with the holding the same feelings, might be time for your pers personal therapy. And I do think one thing that's never, ever, ever discussed, I've never seen it discussed anywhere, balancing your practice. You know, how many traumatized clients have you got? And I think that, you know, and it's very difficult in these these difficult economic times to turn, you know, clients away. But, you know, for the sake of your own, you know, your own mental and, and emotional well-being, if you've got, you know, a, a cohort of traumatized clients bringing very, very heavy material, um, you know, that will have an impact. And, and I encourage therapists to try and balance the practice out. As a supervisor, I will say, you know, try and balance your practice out. 
because it does speak to longevity in the work. And I think that, you know, there comes to a point where, where people just can't go on. They either become very hard into it and lose empathy or they, they, they burn out. So, you know, just please, please, it's a plea. Keep an eye on vicarious trauma. Mm. Keep an eye on your supervision, your own feelings, because, you know, you are, as, as, as the adverts say, worth it. You're worth looking mm. after. Yeah. Yeah, so, so so true, Rory. And, you know, you've touched on supervision. You've talk, touched on, on own therapy. And I, I want to point also to self-care. You know, if you mm. think of yourself as being like a, a cup and the... Uh, that the journey we travel with our clients puts a few drops into that cup, mm. you know, and our own self-care, taking breaks, uh, taking days that we maybe don't go into practice, um, meditating, mindfulness exercises, walking, walking the dog, running, whatever it is for you, yoga, journaling, whatever it is for you that kind of unwinds you. I know for you, Rory, it's a good walk on the hills close by. Mm. For me, it's a walk, it's meditating in the morning and it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of mindfulness. It's considering what I consume. But that self-care, it empties my cup. It empties my cup, which allows a little bit more space for more to come in there. Uh, and that's the that's what self-care is all about. Um, taking regular holidays uh, out of your practice um, having that balance, as Rory said, so, so important and, and, and a great topic, Rory, and I'm very grateful that you brought it today. Again, we look to ourselves as, yes. as the, the, the heartbeat to the practice, being okay so that we can be there in service of others. And we move out of uh, Focus on Self into Practice Matters. I'm super excited for today's episode, Rory. You spoke to Quinn Dexter. Now, um, uh, Quinn Dexter is an autistic man. And uh, I picked him up from uh, my YouTube browsing. He has a channel on YouTube, which is highly, highly recommended. And you can get a link to that in the show notes for today's episode. So go to the Counseling Tutor podcast, click on the podcast tab, go to episode 226. You really want to be having a look at Quinn's uh, um, uh, YouTube channel. Loads of great information on there. As an autistic man myself, I was drawn to reach out to him. Uh, Quinn then said he would love to come and chat to us. And Rory, you met up with him. I did. And as Ken spoke to earlier, he he, he said it's a two-part podcast. The, the first one is obviously this one. And then 227 will be the concluding part of the interview. And we started off by asking Quinn why we shouldn't use person-first language to describe autistic people. And this is what he had to say. Practice Matters. The National Counselling Society is proud to sponsor Practice Matters. National Counselling Society are really excited to have launched their Children and Young People Therapist Register for counsellors working with the younger age group. To find out more, visit nationalcounsellingsociety.org. Nationalcounsellingsociety.org. And we welcome Quinn Dexter, who describes himself as an autistic writer and videographer who is the host of the YouTube channel Autistomatic. So welcome, um, Quinn. Thank you for joining us. Do you want to say a little bit about your YouTube channel? Hi, Rory. Nice to be here. Um, yeah, Autistomatic started on YouTube about three years ago. Um, it was quite honestly a, a direct response to some difficulties I'd faced in my own life. Um, I had a situation whereby my being autistic made a difference to how I dealt with the situation. And it didn't go down very well with uh, my employers at the time, and they wanted to know more. Um, and in the process of doing that, I realised that I'd actually had a pretty easy life of it compared to a lot of my compatriots. And so I decided that perhaps it was time to do something to try and give back to the community to try and um, help to reach out and educate some people um, and it's gone very well um, the channels in the, in the last couple of years has, has really accelerated in terms of subscribers and views um, I've done quite a few um, interviews and the like like this because of it um, and it's surprising how many opportunities have, have come up I found myself involved in uh, a, a a reasonable amount of serious research as well, which has been quite uh, gratifying. So, uh, 
yeah, it's, it's a, a channel there to help both neurotypical people understand and learn about autistic life and how our minds work, how there are differences, but also for autistic people who often feel very, very isolated and alone to know that they're not alone, that other people share the same observations, the same thoughts and feelings, and to encourage uh, even more people to become part of the already thriving and growing autistic online community well i mean thank you very much for sharing that and we will put a link to your youtube channel in in the show notes so people can go to the show notes and uh, and, and, and pick your youtube channel up and in fact learn more and i wanted to start off today with the use of language now when i was training we were always told to use person first language mm-hmm. and i would refer to my grandson who is autistic, as a person with autism, until it was pointed out that actually um, that's not actually correct. Why don't we use person-first language, even, even though it's widely taught? Why should we not use it? Well, you're absolutely right in it, it being widely taught. I mean, uh, my wife is a qualified social worker, and she was taught the same when uh, she did her training back in the late 90s. Um, But there has been a sea change in the perception of autism in recent years, which has been spearheaded by autistic people like myself. Autism is diagnosed on the basis of external observations of behaviours, but those behaviours are expressions of thought processes. What we as autistic people observe in ourselves and each other is not what gets described to us by the rest of the world. So... The move away from person first language is part of reclaiming the narrative and controlling the language is an essential element of that. Pretty much every term for autism has been used as a term of abuse in one way or another, not just by bullies, but by establishment figures, medics, police, the media, everyone. The motivation for person first language is it's a nice thought, but it doesn't work the way it's expected to. It's, it's said out of kindness. Um, people say, oh, you shouldn't let autism define who you are. But that's not the message people get. Um, by skirting around it, by separating it, you actually imply that being autistic is something shameful, um, that we need to separate the individual from their condition. We're not ashamed. In fact, many of us are quite proud of who we are and what we've achieved, not because we're rich, powerful, or respected, but because we've actually survived in a world which thinks that it's disrespectful to mention something which actually does define a great deal of our identity and has a huge impact on our communication, our perception, and our morals. We've kind of decided as a community, not formally, just by mutual consensus, that autistic and autist are okay. And in the process of reclaiming our our own language, if you like, just like the LGBTQIA community have done with queer. Um, Certainly, when you and I were younger, um, that was a term that was very much an abusive one. Mm. Yet now I know plenty of people who have other than heterosexual identities who will quite happily call themselves queer. And it's it's become a completely different thing. And that's what we want to do as well. Um, A lot of autistic people find person-first language quite insulting, to be quite honest. Um, every survey that's ever been done, not just informal ones, but you know, uh, proper academic and scientific surveys and uh, research has always weighed heavily in favour of just describing this as autistic and not one of the euphemisms like um, person-first language, like on the spectrum and the like. Um, and just the same, there are a lot of terms that get bandied about as if they were clinical terms things like severe autism profound autism high functioning low functioning and they don't help us either high functioning to be honest a lot of people say it thinking it's a compliment but it is really actually quite insulting um there's obviously always an element of personal preference in it though um not everybody feels the same way although the vast majority usually it comes out about uh, 80 90 percent of us whenever any of these surveys are done do feel that person first language isn't the way we want to be addressed but there are some who do um so the best way to go about it really from the point of view of a of a practitioner of any sort or anybody who's dealing with autistic people in their working life or in their personal life is to describe us as autistic or an autistic or an autist or autistics as a plural and kind of steer away from everything else as a default but 
once you've got a chance to ask us or we've expressed a preference, stick to that preference. So if I say, no, don't call me autistic, I prefer to be a person with autism or I have autism or whatever my preference is, stick to that. But as the default, autistic or autist is generally the way to go. I mean, I think that's really useful. And, and I have on my notes here that another, another label that we sometimes hear is on the spectrum. Yeah. Um, um, well, actually, my, my, my video last week was on that subject. Um, it is something that, that people generally don't like. The, the, the reason is not just because it's a euphemism. Um, it's also because it implies, in most people's minds, a linear spectrum. Um, phrases like mild and severe or high and low. The spectrum as it should be envisaged now we know more about it than when it was first introduced back in the, well, formally in the 90s, but in theory um, back in the 80s. People think of high and low, they think of mild and severe, but it, that's not the way it works. Um, I would be considered in modern terminology, if you like, the way that most people think of it as being high functioning, the, the old Asperger type. Mm. But that doesn't reflect my daily life. Um, yes, you know, I have a job, I have a wife, I have all the trappings of a, a, an everyday average Joe life. But there are elements of my life that nobody sees. They don't see how confusing everyday things can be to me sometimes. Um, they also don't understand me when I'm trying to explain things, which to me seems screamingly obvious. And sometimes those are things which may be very important because they may, they may be uh, something that which is very risky to somebody, something which it, which is dangerous or something which is harmful or something which could, um, even in a, in a business context, may bring financial harm that I see. But it can be very difficult to get people to understand that because they can't make the connections that my autistic mind does. Um, it's a bit of a cliche to say that autistic people are good at pattern recognition. A lot of us are, not all of us, but it is one of my strengths. And that's caused me to change my career direction in the last few years in that I now work with data um, as opposed to the, uh, I work in the healthcare profession, but I now, so I now work on the data side of it because I've been able to pick up on trends so much faster than anybody else I know and go through the data so much quicker, but that's, because I'm autistic and I have an aptitude for that. It's, um, it's part of the, the, the spiky skill set, but um, that's quite a, a complex thing to get into. But in my case, that's one of my strengths and communication, um, expressing complex topics in simple terms. Those are strengths that, that I can generally bring to the fold. Um, but there are other things that I'm terrible at and small talk has always been one of my weaknesses. Um, I am honest to a fault, and sadly, we live in a world where honesty isn't as prized a quality as people pretend it to be. Um, so whilst there are things that may be seen as positives in some lights, they can be seen in negatives in others, but it does depend on who's talking and who's looking and who's judging. So I, you know, it's, it's a theme that I come back to an awful lot in, in my work and will probably come up today, is that there's an awful lot of things which are very, very subjective that we all think of as objective. Yes, I mean, I think I think that is a really good a really good summary. And I, I want to go on to ask a, a, a question around how common it is for autistic adults to seek counselling or mental health treatment. Um, very common indeed, but it can be a fraught journey getting any help. Part of that is that most of us would prefer to see an autistic counsellor or therapist if we could, um, but they can be very difficult to find. Um, however, any therapist or counsellor can be completely effective if they extend their empathy. Um, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with the concept of radical empathy. Yes. Um, we're not talking quite in that direction. With radical empathy, you are expecting somebody to sometimes suspend their, their moral beliefs or their religious beliefs, political beliefs, mm. whatever. We're not going to that extent. Um, extended empathy is essentially what autistic people do all the time ourselves. Um, are you familiar with the double empathy problem? No, but I'm, I'm sure I'd like to learn that. and I'm, I'm sure our audience would be interested. Um, without going into it in any 
depth, just sort of on the peripheral level. Uh, the double empathy problem is um, it's a theory that Dr. Damien Milton came up with. He's um, a specialist in the Tizard Center. Um, he's autistic himself and he has um, autistic children. Um, and the double empathy theory is something which kind of puts into words something that most of us have known instinctively for a long time. There's some, shall we say, celebrated experts in the field who have basically made a career out of the idea that autistic people lack empathy. We don't. There is no lacking of empathy in most autistic people, but our empathy is biased in exactly the same way as neurotypical empathy is. Cognitive empathy is not knowing what somebody else is thinking. It's believing you know what somebody else is thinking. And that's always based on your own thought processes and your own biases. Um, the cognitive dissonance we see on social media these days, the, the polarization is, is evidence of that. So I think of myself as being, in my own terms, normal, reasonable, moral, a good, upstanding citizen. And so I project my, my own values on other people. And so if they do what I uh, think is right, what I agree with, then I approve of them, I see them as normal, if they don't go along with the same ideas as I believe, then I think there's something wrong with them. I think they're abnormal. And that's what's been happening between autistic and neurotypical people uh, since the beginning of history. <laughs> um, I, I can't quite understand why neurotypical people do a lot of the things they do or why they think the way they do, or why their feelings go in certain directions when mine would go in another. And they can't understand mine. So what we end up with is... Um, uh, effectively the the old immovable object and the unstoppable force that the two sides cannot quite get what the other is thinking and it can lead to hostility it can lead to misunderstandings and unfortunately because of weight of numbers there's 30 times as many neurotypical people as there are autistic people i know that's more than the national autistic society would say but then their figures are about 30 years out of date um you know when it's 30 to 1 we always have to bow to the weight of numbers so if there's 30 neurotypical people telling me I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Even though, even if I don't think I am, if I don't mm -hmm. feel I am, even if I feel that what they're saying is completely and morally reprehensible, the weight of numbers always wins. Now, double empathy is, is looking at these situations in a different way. Instead of saying, I as a neurotypical person have empathy and they as an autistic person have none, or there is, there's this flawed or underdeveloped or childish or any of the other daft ideas that people have come up with over the decades, um, I simply say theirs is different. Um, think of it in a similar way to if you were dealing with a foreigner um, who grows up in a culture which is completely different from yours and their body language, their, their moral values, everything about them may be slightly different to what you're used to. And you can either see them as dysfunctional because they're not like you, or you can just recognise that they come from a different culture and try to find a way of meeting in the middle and understanding that you don't necessarily do the same things or think the same things, but you're coming to the same place and from similar directions. Um, how that relates to the counselling therapy side of things, quite often we're crying out for emotional clarity and support, but we either can't, can't find anybody that we feel we can trust or we've been put off by bad experiences. My own experiences haven't been positive on the whole. Uh, there have been a couple, but most of them have either been bad from the start or they've gone downhill very quickly. Part of the problem is that an awful lot of contemporary counselling is based around ideas that have their roots in cognitive behavioural therapy. And CBT is a non-starter for most autistic people. Asking us to look inside at our own motivations or look at how we dealt with situations or how we might have behaved is pointless because most of us have spent pretty much every night of our lives lying in bed, staring at the ceiling and doing exactly that. The challenge is actually to get us to stop blaming ourselves and actually help us to understand what, what the external factors are that are causing us the pain or the turmoil or the confusion so that we can do something about it. Um, but that does mean going kind of in the opposite direction from that which most counsellors or therapists uh, are going to be, because it's not about looking within, it's about helping us to constructively look without. Um, it does make it difficult finding anybody, 
But the truth of the matter is so many of us are out there screaming for help and not getting it. So there is a huge, for want of a better word, gap in the market um, that needs filling. And you know, because of that, I'm very glad to be talking to you today because it gives me uh, a, an opportunity to talk to people in that field and express that need that, you know, if, if you want to help us, we want to be helped, but you need to rethink the way that you give that help. And, you know, maybe there's some more pointers we can come to um, in this conversation today. But yeah, there is definitely a need out there. We look, we're looking for it, but we rarely find it. And that usually ends up with us hiding away from the world most autistic people don't want to be alone. We just end up alone. Mm. That's the, the, the big thing about it. You know, that's what people misunderstand totally. It's not antisocial. It's just not being able to create those social bonds in the world that we live in today. Yeah. And on that poignant note, this ends part one of our interview. In episode two, which will be episode 227, Quinn Dexter shares essential insights therapists need to understand when counselling autistic people thank you as always a big thank you to quinn dexter uh, for being a guest on the podcast and a big thank you to you rory as always because you host them and you set them up and you take your time to have those conversations beautifully beautifully handled and a great uh, great message there and i think maybe counterintuitive message because we, <laughs> yes. we get so many messages from professionals telling us how it should be what we should do how we should act what we should say uh, but it's interesting behind all of those professional reasonings there are real people that also have a say and and it's about listening uh, in balance and again uh, a call um, if you enjoyed what you heard from Quinn, go to our podcast page so you can go through and support him on his YouTube channel. Really good information, great for therapists or therapists in training. Uh, and you can get that by going to counselingtutor.com. Click on the podcast tab, episode 226, and the link is right there uh, to go and support that channel. Yes, and uh, and an interesting and varied um, chat today, Ken, between us. We started off with Counselling Foundations and we talked about Uh, Carl Rogers' 19 Propositions, Adventures in Phenomenology. We moved on to focus on self and we talked about recognising vicarious trauma, which of course speaks to self-care. And then finally, we talked in practice matters to Quinn Dexter about why we shouldn't use person-first language to describe autistic people. And as always, stay grounded and stay safe. Take the stress out of your counselling studies and get the support of Rory and I by joining us in the Counselling Study Resource. Counselling Study Resource, or CSR for short, is the world's most comprehensive assignment guidance and study support resource for students just like you of counselling and psychotherapy. See how Counselling Study Resource can help you. Visit counsellingtutor.com. That's counsellingtutor.com. Thank you for listening to the Counseling Tutor Podcast. Find the show notes for this episode on our website at www.counselingtutor.com.